get you back, back inside your head Before the summer ends and spread a little love Just for a little fun, I'll make you come Back to me before the rise of every sun Baby, it's meant to be, I know you got a man But he don't understand You're gonna be a heartbreaker You're such a love taker So just Suck me in and you can toss me like a single bed Cause I just wanna be a bad habit, yeah And our love, it's impressive, excessive You can't make this stuff up My chest beats is restless Wakes the neighbors up above mm, Yeah, baby, come and show me love Baby, come and show me love Because you're gonna be a heartbreaker You're such a love taker So just suck me in And you can toss me like a cigarette Cause I just wanna be a bad habit, yeah Take a one-way ride, steal us away to find a place we can hide It wouldn't take much to disappear for a night Just to give it to the need and leave it all behind Cause I know that you know that I know that you want me You told me, now show me, come blow me away Cause I know that you know that I know that you want me You told me, now show me, come blow me away You're gonna be a heartbreaker You're such a love-taker Suggest Hello, everyone, and thanks for watching Inside the Numbers with the People's Pundit. I'm the People's Pundit, your humble host, Rich Barris, and uh, it is Thursday, January 28th. All right, so now that we're back from a little short dash all over the country, from here to there, everywhere, I figured we have a uh, show to do on what we were talking about on our trip, which is the election results, the lessons uh, of those uh, of the election. And what it means for the future of the Republican Party. Okay. In many ways, and I'm going to give you a quick spiel here. By the way, if you're on Locals, I uploaded the PDF. You can uh, follow along with what I'm going to uh, say over the is basically what I showed uh, as we gave the speech. But in many ways, the 2020 election will leave a lot of people scratching their heads because it's a lot of smart people, too. I mean, most policy is filled with dumb people, but. A lot of smart people scratching their heads because, you know, Republicans gained 11 seats. They'll get the one in Louisiana, by the way. Um, I don't want to get into it, but candidate, uh, they need a special election in March. Candidate uh, passed away. Who got the most votes? Louisiana's a jungle primary. So they get that last one in Louisiana. And New York's still counting votes, amazingly. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in truth, it really is. All right, but included, they won 11, including three very tough races in California where I went uh, also uh, earlier this week, all right? And a hold, an important hold by Mike Garcia in California 25. And I'm saying all this for a reason. You're going to see when I put up the uh, little PDF graph, all right? In California 21, David Velladio, who, you know, he's kind of like a highlighted figure here. He made a little oopsie, all right? He defeated TJ Cox 50.1% to 49.6. Very, very tight race. But took back a seat that Republicans lost in 18. Veladio represented the Central Valley District, uh, yeah, from 2013 to 19 before he was beaten by Cox, right? But by the way, that was a 0.8% victory. A very small margin. Young Kim, an assemblywoman, 
by the way, who has the potential to be a rock star, defeated Gil Cisner, uh, Cisneros, Cisneros in a rematch, a rematch race for uh, the district. That includes Fullerton and Buena Park. That was 50.6 to 49.4, another very close race. Michelle Steele in California 48, a county supervisor. She defeated Harley Ruda, who beat Rohrenbacher, all right, 51.1 to 48.9. A very tight race in a district where Bacher used to win pretty handily. And that's in coastal Orange County, where we were. Mm -hmm. All right. Ruda won the seat, like I said, in 18. Dana Rohrbacher was tied. Uh, he was seeking his 16th term in the house. But he was successfully tied by millions of dollars in ads uh, funded by Michael Bloomberg to the Russia collusion hoax. All right. And it worked, and I know it worked because I pulled the district. I pulled for that race. All right. And uh, uh, Ruda was able to keep a lot of, well, Ruda and Fox News' early call that the Democrats won the House before voting was done, was able to keep a lot of Republicans home. And then also a lot of female Republicans did vote for Harley Ruda. But Harley Ruda turned out not to be the moderate that he pretended to be. And he was beaten in 2020. Uh, but Republicans lost the White House, despite the president earning more total votes than any incumbent in the history of the United States. And following the runoffs in Georgia, they lost the majority in the U.S. Senate. Now, it's hard to make sense of this one, all right, admittedly, because in many ways it just doesn't make sense. This presented very much like an incumbent re-election election cycle. In other words, the incumbent party who gets their butt whipped in the midterm, the first term incumbent midterm, it happens, that's history. They always make gains back in the House, maybe not enough to retake the chamber, but they make gains back. 2012 was a very um, recent example of this, all right? And they ma managed to basically fend off uh, challenges in the upper chamber. Connie Mack being another... Um, great example, was not able to take Florida away from Bill Nelson at the time. This is what we need to know about political coalitions. The only thing consistent, the only thing we can count on being constant with political coalitions is that they consistently change. Or the only thing consistent, we can count on being consistent, is that they constantly change. You can learn a lesson of an election cycle. And that lesson can be stale two years later. So parties do not have the luxury of trying to figure out that lesson and take their time while they do it. They do not have the luxury of being wrong like the Republican Party was in 2012 when they came out with their autopsy as to why Mitt Romney lost to Barack Obama. Those conclusions were not the correct conclusions. And they paid a price for it. They paid an electoral price for it. And the, by the way, the, the party itself did. There was a reason why Donald Trump was able to come along and take this party away from them. Because it was a party in shambles. It was a defeated, dying party. They had no constituency outside of a low turnout midterm. With the wind at their back and history on their side. Without that, they could not win. It could never win a national election. People have to understand that this happens in real time. And over time, there can be dramatic changes. And I use this example in the speech, but I'm going to bring it up again. We love the classics. You may have heard me say this before. right? White Christmas, Bing Crosby, and Danny Kaye. Or Danny Kaye wants to go to Vermont to help the girls. right? And Bing Crosby, he's being put in the dark. And he's like, what the hell's in Vermont other than Republicans? Right? Could you imagine even 40 years later, could they imagine no. having a socialist senator representing their state? And by the way, one that wins re-election comfortably with more than 70% of the vote. Absolutely not. But that's how much political coalitions change over time. If the party does not learn the lesson and learn it swiftly, it will lead to electoral disaster. The third thing, that's the second thing you need to know. The third thing you need to know is that the media and punditry class, the consultant class, they are way down on the learning curve. They are almost, 
they are always at least one, if not two, if not more than three or four cycles behind. All right, a great example of this is how they determine what is a bellwether county. All right, in Florida, Hillsborough was the bellwether county since George W. Bush defeated Al Gore in 2000. It can sit, it can kept being the Bellwether County all the way through 04, then 08, then 2012, and then in 16. They never saw the importance of Pinellas. And when they did, Pinellas started to change and no longer presented as the true Bellwether County. Ron DeSantis lost Pinellas County, yet he still carried the state. Donald Trump and Joe Biden effectively tied after Trump won it. Trump won Pinellas County in 2016, yet only won the state by 1.2%, 1.4, 1 1.2. In 2020, he lost Pinellas County by 340 votes or something, yet he overwhelmingly defeated Joe Biden in the state of Florida. A great example as a person is Dave Wasserman. Going on and on about how Joe Biden's up 15 points in Pinellas County. There's no way Donald Trump can carry the state of Florida. They were wrong. You simply don't have the luxury of believing these idiots. You just don't have the time. And the problem with the political class, like the Mitch McConnells, they do believe them. They're not particularly smart people, and they do believe them. So the question remains, and we've talked about all the election irregularities, but it doesn't mean there aren't lessons to be learned for the Republicans to learn, and there are. Mitt Romney going on CNN is not the person to ask about what the future of the Republican Party should be. Carl Rove's op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, which Liz Cheney lady later pushes out to everybody, is not the direction they should go. These people don't know what they're talking about. They had no constituency before Donald Trump, and they don't have one now. It'll be a fine line. Really, the only... Actually, before we get into this, let's just pull it up. Bang. All right, that's the cover page. Here's the house. All right, and I could have chosen to go interactive here, but this is what the United States looks like. Congressional district by congressional district. Take a good look at it. Because Republicans believed so many of the media garbage polls. And because they believed the consultant class telling them, you know, what districts were really in trouble and which ones weren't, or viable and which ones weren't, how badly Donald Trump was going to get beaten in this state or that state, how close Iowa was. I mean, you got to be kidding me. How close Ohio was. Texas may go blue. They ignored districts they could have carried if they'd have only taken the time to understand the Trump coalition, to understand the flaws that polling the as an industry has right now. Because who do they turn to when they ask for this advice? Who are they judging? Who are they basing all of their judgments on? Me. People, well, not me, but people like me. That is a very bad idea. Is not everybody was as accurate as we were. In fact, it was a pretty bad cycle for polling again. Remember Washerman and his congressional district polling, his high quality congressional district polling. What are you going to believe? A couple outliers, a couple conservative polling outliers, or these highly accurate congressional district level polls. And a bunch of them went out the window. And that's important because if Republicans want to take the House back, they really have three choices. One, go full on Trump and abandon California. Then you better win a couple other districts, which we're going to point out. Regardless of what the media polls are telling you is going on in those districts. Two, they can kowtow to Mitt Romney for three seats in California and basically ostracize everybody else and get up. It will be a bloodbath. It will be a bloodbath. They will lose all the gains Donald Trump gave them. Florida 27, goodbye. 26, see ya. 15, don't bother. 13, don't come back for it. 
Georgia 7, trying to follow Mitt Romney to win back Georgia 7 is a fool's errand. It's a fool's errand. Iowa, two or three districts will be gone there. Hell, even Ohio. Texas 15, forget about it. Michigan 8, they tried that in 2020. And we're going to go over some of these. It did not work. During the era of Trump, the Republican Party was trying to straddle the fence here. They never knew which side they wanted to go on. If they would have just stopped fighting the president at every turn, and evolved and recognized that they no longer had a constituency themselves, then he would not look, he would not have looked so toxic as a matter of style. Because it really is a matter of style. That's what it was with Donald Trump. The districts in California where he hurt them. Much of that had to do with style. How do I know? Because when you pulled them on the policy, it wasn't the policy. They supported the policy. It was what they attached to the policy, the persona, the attitude. Yeah, the crass, the bluster, the right. But if you simply took away the wall and replaced it with physical barrier, you got a very different result. Much the same way during the era of Obamacare. If you said the Affordable Care Act instead of Obamacare, you got a very different result. And folks liked Obama, just not in some parts of the country, all right? But this is what it looks like, and for somebody like me, I can look at this right now and say, well, that's clear as day what's going on here, because it's more than just, it's definitely not about race. It's not even anymore just about class. It's more socioeconomic plus experience and geography. It really is. Our experiences really guide our worldviews. And we see the world through the lens of our worldviews. And we formulate beliefs and we weigh arguments through through the experiences that we have had. And you can see this clear as day. You can see it clear as day. What I see here is the impact, the long-term impact, of Republican dominance at the state level in many of these states over the years, going all the way back to Nevada, hell, even New Mexico, and the industries they bring in because they're pro-business, right? The industries they bring in to the Phoenix area, to the Atlanta metro area, and north in Georgia 7, to DeKalb County, They are job gains and temporary approval ratings that send the party on a collision course in the long term. The state gets bluer and bluer and bluer, and it goes to the Democrats. That's what I see when I look at this map. Because Democrats are now becoming the party of the rich, the elite, and the wannabe elite which is what I've been calling them for a long time. They're not elite. They just feel social desirability pressures more than anybody else because they want to be. So they're particularly swayed by arguments like decent. This isn't decent. Have some decency, man. Come on, man. Have some decency. They're swayed by that crap doesn't matter. It really doesn't make sense. It's about attitude. It's about who you are and where you come from and how you're expected to behave, how you're expected to act, how you're expected to think and who you're expected to vote for. All right. Here is the flipped house districts in 2020. Let's go through them. We went through uh, 21 already. 2016 margin was 13.4. With Donald Trump on the ballot, folks. In 2018, it was less than a point D. Cox won. David Velladio took it back. R plus 1.7 swing. That's it. Do you think Mr. Velladio has the luxury of voting for impeachment, even in a district like that, where he'll piss off Trump voters and then he won't have a single 
path to victory if if he chooses to run again in two years. Because in truth, Laura, you know what it was. You know what it is, what they didn't understand in their political calculation. The left and the middle will not remember that in two years. But the Trump voter will. He's a different, he and she, they are different breeds. They're not going to forget that, David. The middle won't give a damn in two years because that's how America is. We move forward. They're not going to say, well, what did you do with Donald Trump? Without a hearing. Mm -hmm. Without any impeachment proceedings whatsoever. What was your vote, David? No. Somebody says Van Lee. Valadio, Valadio, whatever. Valadio, as a popular female Democrat. California 39. Moving on. No, they said there's a popular female Democrat running against him. Yeah, his, he's done. Mm -hmm. Barring some real strong wins in the Republican direction, he's done. All he did was isolate 5 to 6% of the Republican base that will not come out. Don't believe me, David? Ask your other buddy, David. Purdue. I hear he's got other plans. He went down. Thinking. Foolishly. And arrogantly. That he outperformed the president in November. Because he's just more popular. Because he was more of a centrist. He was more appeal, you know, appealing. More acceptable. No. You got some voters Trump didn't get, but you never would have gotten that margin if not for the Trump base in the electorate. They would not be there without Donald Trump. So the Republican Party better think long and hard and not actually, they better think hard, but not too long. Because mm -hmm. there's no time to have this massive debate. Those who don't agree with me are wrong. That's it. They're wrong. They don't have the luxury of trying to make a counter argument. All right. There's no time. There's no time. Mm -hmm. Young Kim beat Gill. 4.4 point swing. Gill beat her by 3.2%. For those of you who don't remember, Young Kim became the only freshman congresswoman to go to Capitol Hill, get sworn in as a freshman, and then only to be yanked back to California because ballots kept trickling in and she was defeated. That race was called by the AP. So good for her. She came back and took what was rightfully hers in 2018. All right. Harley Ruda. We went over this already. That was a 9.2% swing. I do think with somebody like a Michelle Steele, there's opportunity in Orange County to expand that lead. I think they can at least get comfortable to like a six, seven point win. Um, but the other ones are going to be tough. And why am I spending so much time on that? Because what Mitt Romney and the rest of these idiots are telling you is weigh a couple of these seats against everything else we're going to talk about in a second. The right answer, I'm just going to give it away. Spoiler alert. The right answer is the Trump base is going to have to understand that California, okay, has to talk a, a different way. And I'm going to show you demographically why that is. They can be loyal. They can stand on principle. They just have to do it with a different style. And the Trump base is going to have to give them the leeway to do that. Now, that doesn't mean be like David and commit suicide. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about here. You don't have to betray your party in principle. For a fraud. Mm -hmm. It was a scam. Another scam. You don't have to do that. In order to be reelected. In fact you made it That's much harder. For you to be reelected. Because like I said the middle's not going to care. You're not going to get those democrat votes anyway. They're not coming to you. The middle will not remember. The base will. That's who you pissed off. All right. Moving to Florida. Very important here. Florida 26. Democrats took it by less than two points last time. Uh, Debbie, uh, well, Carl Powell, right? 
uh, was defeated by Carlos Gomez by just over um, two points. It was about a 4.2% swing, all right? And then in Florida, 27, which was a only a 10, just under 10-point margin in 16 because of Ileana Rose Langton. She was a very popular incumbent Republican, had relationships with the Jewish community, the Hispanic community, but that district was trending Democratic. The only reason why she would win by these margins, and it shrunk over time, by the way, she used to win by big margins. 9.8 is nothing for Ileana Rose Langton. That was a sh uh, shockingly shrinking margin. It went for six points to Donna Shalala in 2018 when it was an open seat. Maria, another rematch. Maria Elvira Salazar came back and she took it. It was an 8.8, .8, R plus 8.8 .8 swing, just under nine points. Let me say this as clear as I possibly can. Donald Trump won this district by almost threefold, more than threefold. Without Donald Trump's appeal, to Hispanics in the 27th Congressional District, Maria Salazar would not have defeated Donna Shalala. You understand what I'm saying to you? It was not because Donna Shalala, I mean, uh, Maria Salazar was the, uh, it was not because Maria Salazar was the moderate female Hispanic. It was because Maria Salazar ran on the ticket with Donald Trump. And this area saw Double-digit swings to Donald Trump. It's part of Miami-Dade, for people who don't know. Which, as you do know, if you watch the show, Miami-Dade swung from a 30-point loss to a six, a 34-point loss for Trump in 2016 to a six-point loss. Nearly 30-point swing. So when you're deciding which way to go, Republicans... And you had Mitt Romney, the idiot, who lost Florida on CNN, talking about how we need to give way to other voices and go back to decency. Ask Mitt Romney how he did in Florida 27. <laughs> Ask Mitt Romney why he couldn't scrape up another 65,000 votes. When Donald Trump won by three points, hundreds of thousands of votes, a 300,000 vote margin. All right. Georgia seven. This is important. Rob Woodall. This was an open seat. So it is possible with a three point swing to Democrats. All right. Republicans held it by two tenths of a percentage point in 2018, but this is the area. Nor it's North of the Atlanta Metro area, professional class. Like I was telling you before, a lot of Republican leaderships, free trade, free trade, free trade. Come on in, coming in, coming in. Turning their state blue. For a temporarily high approval rating. And because they get paid to. Because that's what their campaign donors want them to do. Rob Woodall could not hold on and Carolyn Bordeaux defeated him. I'm not saying it's a district they've lost forever, but it's trending in the wrong direction for Republicans. Point being, again, listening to Mitt Romney is not at all likely to get you back Georgia 7. All right? Just it. And is it worth it to give up the gains everywhere else? A lot of blue in the left column, folks. A lot of red in the right. What, you're, what Mitt Romney and company are, are advocating it's to give up all the red and the right for a chance at some of that blue. Which makes no this sense. is why I love visualizations and colors, and mm -hmm. it, it really drills in. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Iowa won. Let's get very clear here. Hold on. You also have to remember Mitt Let me put this up. is pandering to his base, which is the Democratic. Party. Yeah, he's pandering to his base. <laughs> Let me put this bigger so everybody can see this. Iowa won. 2016 margin, 7.6. Wait, Trump on the ballot, by the way. Hint, hint. 2018 margin, D plus, 3.6. Abby Finkenauer went down to Ashley Hinson, and the swing was 6.2%. 2018 
We're not talking about enormous victory here. This is an area Barack Obama did pretty damn well in. Without Donald Trump on the ballot, like we saw in 2018, this district could be going, going, gone, goodbye. If you want to know the power of the Trump coalition, Iowa too. In 2016, it still went for a Democrat, 7.5 by 7.5 points. And in 2018, it went 12.2 without Donald Trump on the ballot. Dave Loback was a very strong candidate, or Loebsack, whatever they say, very strong candidate with an open seat and Trump on the ballot because he was gone. Marionette Miller Meeks saw a 12.2% swing and took that district back. Folks, they were separated by a handful of votes. That one came down to the wire. It was a late call, one of those seats we were waiting. Iowa, too, is not a safe Republican seat. If you listen to Mitt Romney, it will be gone. Michigan, three. In 2016, it was R plus 32. There's an asterisk there for a reason. In 2018, it was R plus 11.2. Okay, Justin Amash was already losing steam in that district. It's labeled as open because, as you all know, Justin Amash left the party, ran as a libertarian, and was defeated by Peter. Peter. It was a 5.2% swing because it was a more crowded field. This fraud ran against Justin Amash and for the Republican nomination. Because of Justin Amash's vote to impeach Donald Trump on Ukraine. Then what does he do? He calls to donors. He says, give me money. I won't fall for a hoax impeachment. I'll stand with our president. I can't tell you how many pissed off people I have directly heard from who gave this fraud money. He voted to impeach Donald Trump. And he knows, by the way, that it's his (laughs) you-know-what. Afterwards, from what I hear, he was extreme. He was like in a full-fledged sweat. Yep. He was like, oh, my God, what have I done? (laughs) He was too, he's a freshman. He was too stupid or naive, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. He got caught up and he got swept up. And he didn't even bother to read a transcript. So this will be a fight because of cowardice this will be a fight and democrats absolutely could under the right circumstances take this district why why is everybody getting the lesson yet minnesota seven (laughs) good old colin peterson right robert and i talked about this how many times 5.1 percent he won in 2016 It started to shrink 4.3%. Used to be comfortable for Colin. Used to be comfortable. He knew he was done. Especially with Trump on the ballot. In 2018, those of you who have watched uh, me for a while, you know I made a very clear argument after 2018. Republicans got shellacked everywhere, yet they flipped three seats. The media never talked to you about. Two were in Minnesota and one were in Pennsylvania. And my entire point was... What the hell does that tell you? All right. Anyway, Michelle Fishbach saw an 18-point swing nearly with Donald Trump on the ballot in Minnesota 7, and she defeated Peterson, who knew his time was short. New Mexico 2 in 2016. This has been changed, by the way. Um, It was a big margin for Republicans, 25.5%. Flipped to Democrats, 1.8%. But... Yvette Harrell saw a nice swing and won it by about eight points, a little under eight points. New York 11, another one, comfortable Republican margin, uh, saw a swing uh, to Democrats, big one, about 30-point swing in 2018. Max Rose uh, was the incumbent, 6.4%. But Nicole, um, I don't even want to kill your name, Nicole, and I know I'm half Greek too, so I get it. I'm gonna, so if I, if I destroy your name, Maliotakis? That right. sounds about right. 12.7 point, uh, 12.7 point swing uh, to Republicans in New York 11. Again, what kind of district is New York 11, right? North Carolina 2 and 6. Um, 
obscure the argument. My argument is even stronger than it looks on this graph because North Carolina two and six are not the old North Carolina two and sixes. This was part of Sue to your blue. So what you see in the margin in 16 and then even 18 with George Holding and Mark Walker are pointless. Deborah Ross defeated George Holding because, which by the way was an open seat, was I mean, it's not even true. It was an open seat. Deborah Ross is now the congresswoman because the district got cut up. This is a completely new district. They peeled it into a, a safe Democratic district. Kathy Manning, same thing. All right. Well, not safe, but likely Democrat. Oklahoma 5, one of those districts where Democrats were able to eke out a win, but we saw a 3.2% uh, swing to Stephanie Bice. You guys might have remembered me commenting on that race and some polling that was done in that district. Stephanie Bice did indeed win. South Carolina won. Nancy the Fraud Mace uh, only beat Joe Cunningham because she claimed to be MAGA. And now um, she's done. Another one. Burgess Owens, a Trumper through and through, defeated Ben McAdams. All right. In a very tight race for Utah four that they could never have won without Donald Trump on the ballot. All right. Let's bring this up. Hat tip Politico while I get a sip of water. <laughs> Drink up, baby. You need it. Especially from all the flying. Oh. Freaking tooth. I cracked yeah. a tooth, folks. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, you probably don't want to hear about that. But that was special. Take a second to look at Politico's. This is from Politico. And they were right to point out these districts. Take a second to look at the districts where we saw the biggest swings. <laughs> <laughs> what really ticks me off is that Texas 15. Oh, yeah. Because that is a media fabrication. Oh. That was a loss because of media fabrication. Republicans believed the nonsense that Texas was going to turn blue because of Hispanics being a rising share of the electorate and white voters fleeing from the suburbs. In fact, it was me uh, Mexicans particularly. In West Texas and in the central southern part of the state where Texas 15 is that denied Joe Biden the state of Texas. It was the complete opposite of what these geniuses had been espousing for months on end. The complete opposite. And that district could have went. A little bit of money, folks. A little bit of time. That could have went. So could Wisconsin's third congressional district. Michigan's third moved a net negative six because of the reasons, the aforementioned reasons, Justin Amash's district, okay, with three on the ballot, and now you have mayor, he stepped in it, all right, whatever his name is, people are like, it's major, I don't care what his name is, his name is fraud, his name is I defrauded donors, all right, so let's look after we got a good breath of this, these are the key house districts now after 2020 that really drive the point home. Florida 13, Charlie Crist. He won it by six points. Anna was left to fend for herself. She could have taken this district from Charlie Crist. If people didn't believe the nonsense from the Dave Washermans, this is a Tampa area. Nobody wanted to give money or time or resources to her because everybody believed the nonsense that Donald Trump was going to lose Pinellas County by 15 points. And this carves into Hillsborough too. Donald Trump arrested, arrested the leftward swing in Hillsborough County. He kept it basically where it was for Ron DeSantis. This district could have went. Cindy Axney, one, uh, Iowa 3rd's congressional district, won it by a hair. Every single one of Iowa's districts should be uh, represented by Republicans. We've gone over Iowa in great detail, county by county, in prior episodes. Every single one of those districts should be in Republican hands. But Quinnipiac, Biden plus one. New York Times, Biden plus four. He lost that state by almost 10 points. Some of the most egregious, ridiculous polling misses 
of our time in Iowa and Ohio. Illinois 14. Lauren Underwood absolutely could have lost. Alyssa Slotkin, a big blunder. You all know how I feel about this. Oakland is not coming back. Northern Oakland will continue to get encroached upon by Southern Oakland. Warren will continue to encroach upon Holly. You understand what I'm saying? You cannot rely on Northern Oakland anymore. The key to a Republican win in Michigan 8 is to use the dominant registration of Livingston County and minimize your butt whooping in Ingham and in Northern Oakland. But they didn't listen. They went with Paul Young. He lost Ingham. He lost Northern Oakland. And he couldn't get it done in Livingston. And he lost painfully a slim 3.5%, basically. Mm-hmm. Laura, did I or did I not say that if they do not nominate Mike Dittmer, they are going to lose this district by a hair? Did I or did I not tell them that? And even publicly on Twitter. That was one of those losses where you're like, I told you so, but you hate saying I told you so. Sometimes it really, truly sucks to be right. Yeah, it does. does. Mike Dittmer was the only one who was going to take it to her. He grew up in Oakland and now calls Livingston home. Paul Young just moved back to the district six months before he filed and had been living in California. All of his money, they were like, well, he can raise money. All of his money came from friends and family and big donors out in California where they lent him a quarter million dollars. Mike Dittmer almost beat him in the primary with 50 grand, less than 50 grand. What the hell does that tell you? Haley's, I mean, really, I mean, there is like, you have got to be incompetent. You, you just, you should find another line of work. If you continue to it, to, um, advise people on this, on these kinds of like this conventional wisdom, that's just like the Carl Rove conventional wisdom. It's over. over. You're a dinosaur. You don't understand the Republican coalition at all. And by the way, they got lucky. He what, what does he even call him the architect? He's the architect of a 10,000 vote re-election? He barely won Iowa, Laura. If Iowa didn't go for Georgia, he lost New Hampshire. He won it in 2000, but he lost it because he started a war in Iraq. If he didn't win Iowa, he wasn't going to be re-elected, and John Kerry would have been president. That's supposed to be some famed architect? Are you kidding me? Haley Stevens, Michigan 11. I got to be honest. Even when we pulled Michigan 11, it was looking like five, six points. She barely hung on. Had a, a, Republicans didn't have really have a bench out there. They needed a bench, but Michigan 11 is one of those districts where they just like ignored now for a while. And people throw their hat in the ring. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, you know. I want to get into it, but there needs to be a viable candidate in Michigan 11. Minnesota 3, Angie Craig, 2.2%. That's it. New Jersey, by the way, nothing got dumped into that. New Jersey 7, Tom Malinowski, 1.2%. New Jersey 7 is basically a Republican district, if you look at it demographically. The only one who had any resource at all was Jeff Van Drip, who, if you guys remember, was the Democrat in 2018. He won, unseated a Republican. No, really, I think that was open, actually. Yeah, that one was open, I think. And then um, turned into a Republican because of impeachment. Thought it was that He thought it was outrageous. Uh, Vincente Gonzalez in Texas 15 barely won. And I don't know the future of that district. It is wholly contingent on what the Republican Party does moving forward. If they do not take the Trump platform and run with it, then Texas 15 will slide more to the left again. Because you just can't win the um, 
you can't get that rural vote out down there plus add working Mexicans. You understand what I'm saying? You just can't do it with a regular Republican message. Abigail Spanberger, they were afraid of. A CIA operative who barely won the district in 2018, they were afraid of her. Again, no, not really a serious challenge. D plus 1.9. That's it. That was Dave Bratz's old district, folks. Once upon a time was the district for the House Majority Leader, Eric Cantor. Or Majority Whip. No, Leader, right? Yeah. Anyway, Ron Kine, two in Wisconsin, three. Very much in play, along with Angie Craig, who couldn't even hit 50%. Ron Kine, very similar uh, situation. Very similar kind of districts. And without all the fighting and the back and forth and the muddling of the message, because if you constantly, you know what they did when they were fighting with Trump? They were muddling what they stood for. Do you or do you not stand with the working man and woman? His own party is kind of fighting him all the time. So does that mean those down ballot candidates really aren't for me? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what that says. All right. And what makes all of this worse is what you guys saw during the election 2020 public polling project that we conducted uh, through you guys who funded it on Inside the Numbers. All right. Because they're all running to people in my industry to tell them what districts, what suburbs to focus on. Here is why these people should look at results more than – don't look at projected behavior. We now have results. Make an informed decision based on actual results. Remember this question, how comfortable or uncomfortable are you telling each group of people, and in this case it was pollsters because we had family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, strangers, and pollsters. How comfortable or uncomfortable are you telling each group of people, in this case pollsters, about your political beliefs such as how you intend to vote? Look at the numbers in the battleground states. And then these people take this for Arizona, for instance, almost 21%. Florida, 16.6%. Pennsylvania, 13.6%. Michigan, 17.3%. Minnesota, 15%. Wisconsin, 20.2%. Very uncomfortable. Somewhat uncomfortable. It really boils down to um, like a, around a third or more. Sometimes nearly 4 in 10. In these states, told us they were at least so somewhat uncomfortable. That's a statistical nightmare. The level of uncertainty that that injects into the results should give us all a little bit of modesty. You know, stop pretending like we know definitively what these people are saying. Because we don't. As most of our track records obviously show. So parties, not just the parties, should base their decisions on actual behavior, not the project, not the projected behavior. That is the track record proven most inaccurate. All right. Now again, there are some seats in California. If Republicans want to take the House in 2022, it would at least buffer them. To try to hold these seats that they have won. And maybe get back another one or two. You'll notice that there weren't many rich targets on our list in California. And the reason is simple. Some of the districts Republicans represented years and years. Are going to get increasingly difficult to win. Forget win back. To win it all. Why? Alright. Hat tip. Public Policy Institute of California. California is seeing an increase in college graduates that are middle-aged, you know, at least middle-aged, while losing less educated adults. All right, you can see there is a gain in those who have a bachelor's degree or higher, while they're basically losing population to other states in every other category. Point of fact, you look at a state like Ohio and Iowa, 
even Florida, where Trump romped it with the 30 to 44-year-old category with no college degree. And Republicans were the benefactors of his performance among that group. That is the group that's fleeing California. <laughs> they are fleeing it, man. Also, of course, who's coming there, right? And there it is. Yeah. So they're taking net migration from other countries over time. You can clearly see there has been an increase. You really see from that 1970 to 2010, the damage over 40 years that was done to Republican chances of winning the state of California. Once a reliably red state. Let me say that again. California was once a reliably red state. Richard Nixon was the governor of California. Carried it overwhelmingly. Ronald Reagan was the governor of California. Carried it overwhelmingly. They didn't change minds to change California. They changed people. They swapped you out. And you can see it. Look at 1990. Everybody's taken off. They're leaving the state in droves throughout the 90s. While people from more government friendly, let's call it that, Latino states, na nation states, Mexico, Argentina, not the places where we have seen people inherit big government and Marxism and socialism. So they know it like the Venezuelans and the Cubans. They have lived with it and they run away to get the hell away from it. And they know a fake. They know a false promise by a big government politician when they hear one. And you can't fool them. They know a spineless person. They know it when they hear it. On the flip side of that, California was getting a lot of Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. They haven't really, they didn't get there yet. But they know that they want a government that does deal a lot of social services. But because they didn't get to see what happens at the end of that rainbow, <laughs> they are happy and so, and, and fiscally speaking, are liberal. And certainly, living in California over time, become more socially liberal, right? All right, so that's a catastrophe for a Republican Party. It's not race. It's experience. It's where we come from, the experiences we have. Nothing to do with genes. There's nothing in the Hispanic gene that says, I'm a Democrat. I vote for big government. It's the individual nation states that are receiving these different groups of people. And then it also is true that Florida and Texas have done a better job. Welcome, uh, or let me put this specifically. Republic, Texas Republicans and Florida Republicans have done a better job of welcoming new Hispanic groups and assimilating them. They just have. Texas actually was doing it before the Cuban wave. Mm -hmm. All right. And here is where Californians have moved the left. Keep it to the left first. Just a way to kind of tell you the way the landscape is changing. Texas. Arizona. Right. Nevada. That is what is keeping these states competitive if it wasn't for the new arrivals in arizona and texas republicans would be in bigger trouble if it wasn't for the people fleeing california and moving to texas ted cruz would have lost in 2018 beto o'rourke would have beaten ted cruz if it wasn't for the, these people that you saw in the graph before arizona remains competitive, even though it's clearly shifting Democratic. It remains competitive because of these people. 
and in the Grand Canyon Battleground Poll, in which state or territory were you born, or were you born outside the U.S.? The largest state for those new arrivals was California, 8.1. The first generation Arizonian was the most likely Trump voter. More likely by seven points than a third generation. And the second generation is really the professional class. So the, the third generation, more conservative third generation, raised um, liberals. Mm -hmm. And then also, so it's not just going to school, but also those who came there. For those professional class jobs, their children are even more liberal. All right, and that, that's the pattern we're seeing. And by the way, Nevada, much closer than I thought it was going to be. But again, now I see why. Because in point of fact, some people are leaving and going to like Douglas, Douglas County. They're leaving California from Northern California or something, and they're going to Douglas County. Washoe County, where Reno is, would probably go back Republican over time if it wasn't for the Asian migration. So there, are, it's not the Hispanic population. Oh, it's the Asian. Yeah. Um, 20 years ago, that was a battleground group. But that's because now they're coming from China and other areas where they're much, much, much more. And liberals, not even a word. They're left wing. Asians were more conservative in the 90s. Even in the early 2000s. Bush v. Gore, they were a battleground group. Yeah. These were people who were fleeing the oppression in communist China. Now, the communist regime has done a complete makeover. And they're claimed to be pragmatic, and they really push um, nationalism, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's go take a look at some of these questions here, all right? Yeah, any hope in California 10? It was a red district until 2018. Demographics have changed a little from the Bay Area transplants, but it's a strong conservative base. Um, ballot harvesting has stolen the district. Yeah, there's no doubt ballot harvesting in California has made things very, very, very uh, tough on Republicans. But I do think California 10 is one of those districts where uh, Republicans can make relative gains. Just so people understand, it was... Let me get the margin here. So, Josh Harder won with 55% of the vote. Yeah, I mean, look. My suggestion is going to be candidate recruitment, okay? A 10-point swing is not really all that significant. It's just... It's not, all right? Uh, in an election where, you know, things can turn on a dime a national mood could really push things around it's not it's just it it's not undoable and in fact there are some districts in oregon like uh four oregon house four and in washington that'll be a little bit tougher in washington house eight uh district eight in washington kim schreier held on against jesse jensen but again that's because they just decided that these people didn't really have a shot Trump was going to lead to a slaughter in the suburbs, and that was going to be it. Um, candidate recruitment, and I said this, I told people this uh, during the speech, which I'll upload when, when I can, or when I get it. Candidate recruitment matters. You have to have younger, articulate, can you know, younger candidates who can articulate the message. Mike Garcia is just a fantastic example. This is a guy who performed in places like Ventura and even the suburbs of L.A. County, where I just didn't think a Republican could do that well, Laura. I just flat out didn't. All right. Um, and I'm going to give me 30 seconds or so. I'm going to take a real quick 30-second break. And uh, when we come back, actually, while I'm taking that 30-second break, I'm going to read some of the questions. All right. And we will come back and I'll answer them. 
All right, so give me 30 seconds. You're watching Inside the Numbers with the People's Pundit. Do not forget, if you're watching on YouTube, to subscribe and hit the like button. All right? You can find us on Locals, too, where you'll get little snapshots of what's inside my brain. If you want to support the community, it's peoplespundit.locals.com. All right? Um, and, of course, Facebook Live. You're watching on Facebook Live. Don't forget to like the page, People's Pundit Daily. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Kind of funny. One question, Laura was just telling me. Some people are saying you should give us some states on where we could flee to. That'll stay red for a while. Well, I don't know your industry or what you do for a living. So, like, you know, that might be a little bit hard. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, we didn't move to Virginia because, you know, I'm a gun owner. Um, I thought it was more. First of all, I, I did like Virginia, but it just. Virginia isn't the same that it was physically, like the way it looks in the communities. Not the same that it was even 10 years ago. Uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful little towns are now. Uh, I watched it happen in upstate New York, too. You know, one party control destroys things, man. Especially when the one party is against your entire culture. So, I mean, it really... How is the GOP this stupid? I don't know, Jim. Part of them, part part of them is it's it's part stupidity, it's part corruption. It's a lot of corruption, and it's a part arrogance because look at Georgia lore. I mean, these people really thought they were going to win. No, the GOP will align with what best their business, what's best for yeah. their pocket. Yeah, for their pockets. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So they'll stab you in the back. That's why the certain candidate that we need to find now are candidates that have a spine and candidates that are loyal yep. to their constituents. Yeah. So it, everybody's like, I'm well, just going here to answer a question. Kind of candidate? But for each state and each district, it's a different type of person. That yes. Sits. That's why I'm saying, like, let Mike Garcia. In California 25, be a model. Not because Mike Garcia should be like cloned mm -hmm. and run. No, because he fit the district so that beautifully. District. Mike Dittmer fit Michigan 8 Perfect. perfectly. They screwed that one. Who do you think came up with the Mike Speaks Michigan? That was perfect. <laughs> Yet they chose not to give the guy any money. That would have cut across to northern Oakland. Yeah. That would have minimized the bloodbath up there. All right, um, Ryan, I put it back on the screen to show you here. Let me go uh, North Carolina two and six. Uh, what's up with that? That's redistricting. It looked like North Carolina was swinging to the left. It looked like it could be the new Virginia, uh, but Trump held it off. All right, that's redistricting. Those That was part of the Sue to your blue campaign. The, those two and six now are not the two and six of old, pre-2020. Mm -hmm. They're totally different districts. They've been carved up to be, I wouldn't say solid. They're not safe Democratic seats, but they are leans to likely. We take a serious national mood to think about that, right? Um, yeah, we'll have to see what they do. With the uh, redistricting maps. Yes. I mean, we'll just have to see. I mean, Democrats got away with cutting it up in a lot of places. They have federal judges now. They have, you know, state judges even that are willing to weigh in on this and get in the way. Uh, now is the time to fight with the redistricting and have it more so in our favor. And not just give in to this. And Glenn, I do, Glenn Schumann... That is key. And for those, you know, he said, does this make sense? Republicans control legislatures and states with 329 electoral college votes, election integrity, 
should be the Republicans' number one task in 2021 in those states. Absolutely, Glenn. If you doubted how important I made this, how much I stressed this, if you doubted me, what all you have to do is look toward what Democrats are doing in the House and the Senate. What is their first bill, HR1? They're trying to make this electoral chaos permanent. Mm -hmm. So COVID, like I said, was used as a predicate to change our election laws. Without those changes, Donald Trump wins in a landslide. It would not have even have been close. A landslide. All right. Uh, let's see what else we got here. What can a regular person who is not running for office do? Also, I have family and family friends on Wall Street are huge secret Trumpers. What advice do you have for them? Don't be afraid. I don't want to tell you something that's maybe lose your job or yeah, something. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, if it was me, because I was in the financial sector, I'll take my book and go elsewhere. I took a $15 million book away from a firm, yeah. right? Because yes, I disagreed with them. Well, with the, and then yeah. when the oh. financial crisis hit, you were right. one of them considered suing me for alerting my clients that the bond debt was bad debt. Dump it. Of course, they couldn't because after by the time that was going to make its way through the, through the court system, no judge in their right mind after everything collapsed. Mm -hmm. No judge in their right mind was going to hold. Yeah. Allow that case in their courtroom. Judge, your honor. He signed an NDA. He was not supposed to tell his clients we were screwing them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lehman no. Brothers was bad debt and he wasn't supposed to tell them. No, I don't think so. So, I mean, uh, I would, t if it was me and I was in the position where you guys are, I don't know what you do on Wall Street, but I mean, if you're institutional traders or something, I would take, I would take that book and I would run with it. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't know what it is that your family does, but what can a normal person do who is not running for office? Well, first of all, I would implore um, you guys to run for office if you're a sound candidate and you think you can make a difference. If you are a conservative stay-at-home mom or dad and you have a college degree or you were going to be a teacher but now you're home because you had kids or whatever, maybe, and you're uh, in a, a red area, why is your superintendent blue? You know, mm -hmm. Run and defeat them. If you want to do something, you can get involved with something that doesn't take an awful lot of time. It's not awfully demanding. In your local supervisor of elections office, or maybe it's a county clerk or a registrar, whatever they call it in your area, it's not in, it's not incredibly demanding, and you can do it. Don't don't cede that to them, because as we found out in 2020, just as important as who is actually voting and how they're voting is who is counting the votes. And for far too long, Republicans have just kind of allowed them to count votes in their areas mm -hmm. and gave them the benefit of the doubt, a benefit that they don't deserve. Also, you can certainly knock on doors. You can certainly uh, make calls and you can certainly just talk to your friends and family. Learn how to be persuasive. Don't talk in partisan terms. Talk in personal terms. Maybe you have a friend whose daughter was just screwed over by Joe Biden's executive order, allowing men who are mentally disturbed, who think they're women, to compete in female sports. What about your scholarship, Jane Doe, Jane Smith? What about your daughter's scholarship? How tragic. How tragic. At your end right there. That's a freaking no-brainer. Mm -hmm. You want to win the suburbs back in Connecticut, and New Hampshire, New England, where they take these sports, you know, even in the Midwest, mm -hmm. they take these sports serious as hell. 
their their children rely on their athletic abilities to get into college. That is the that is their jump off point for life. And Joe Biden just virtue signaled their future away. Just don't talk in partisan terms. Talk in personal terms. Really? I mean, that's uh, if you can't or don't think that you have time to run. And, of course, the other thing would be um, when we are, and it does take longer than I would have liked, but when we are up and running with our, uh, yeah, with our nonprofit, you know, help support it. Even if you can't financially we're share marry it. marry these people out for you. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. Because we'll be, we'll, we'll be glad to do the heavy lifting for you. You know, as long as we have the support of people to do so. Mm -hmm. All right. Um... <laughs> Has any Republican who matters started listening to you or are they losing on purpose? <laughs> you know, Brian, sometimes I think they are losing on purpose. I really do. I know um, that people were listening. Um, there's a fight going on right now. You know, so for instance, in Georgia, the state party, you know, contacted us and I'm like, what do we do about this? Um, but the Purdue campaign was uninterested. They were uninterested. It was, it really was incredible. It's not, I mean, in Florida, they largely do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just have, we know um, it's different, but Unfortunately for the president, people in his orbit weren't taking seriously what I was saying in the months leading up to the election. And Rona, well, she would go on Twitter, big win in the court today. A judge said they can't do this. Even when they won, they lost. Because in the end, Democrats figured out a way to do it anyway. A judge stops them from ballot harvesting. No problem. Mark Zuckerberg is going to fund you some drop boxes, baby. No problem. The U.S. Postal Service has got your back. Those ballots are late. No problem. We'll backdate them. I mean, it's incredible. Rich, if America first pro-Trump candidates lose to rhinos in their primaries, should we hold our nose and still vote? Some games might be played by flooding the field with Nancy Maces. That's a great question. That will be answered on a case by case basis. I mean, ultimately, you got to do what your conscience tells you to do. But I, for one, will tell you this. Or I will tell you this. I, for one, will not vote for a party. I never liked it. Never liked doing it to begin with. And the ultimately, the only way these people are going to hear, like, look, it's true Republicans in, in Georgia cut off their nose to spite their face. But at the same time, I also understand their point of view because I feel that way too. I'm I'm not I don't vote for party. I if I register for a party, it's because I want to vote in a primary and I want to have a say in who is the nominee. But I generally speaking think that parties have to earn your vote. I believe they have to earn your vote. Republicans have come to depend on your vote like Democrats have come to depend on black Americans for their votes. They take you for granted if you're a Republican voter. They're no better than what they accuse Democrats of doing to blacks in urban America. They are no better. But, um, somebody just made a comment, which makes me want to jump in real quick, um, that going along the lines of what we can do to also change. You know, the left has a dominant hand in the immigrants that come across into the United States. Like, all these immigrants... Yes, are, because they're guiding immigration yes, policy. But I'm saying, wouldn't it be great to have a Republican, conservative, whatever you want to call it, like, right side coalition that sits there and actually teaches, this is why you ran from this country? Yeah. Well, that's Let's what Florida, honestly, Florida Florida's Republicans, definitely. they did do a good job of that. In, uh, in Texas, um, I don't know... In truth, I it's I don't know when that started, um, but they had been very very successful at doing that as well. 
the fact of the matter is Democrats definitely and under Obama, they did this. This happened. This is true. They would steer the refugee resettlement program and the uh, the the chains because that's the chain is the, really the problem. Chain migration is really the problem. All right. Um, they would steer those chains in the areas. And there's when you look at what they did, the only explanation is that it was politically driven. So I'm going to, in the long term, tur- tur- turn this state blue. Like, you know, th- that's what they did. Um, Republicans don't do the same outside of how they encourage Cubans to come in Florida. That's the only comparable example because they did. There was a point where they did that. I mm-hmm. mean, they did. And um, it was only because Republicans stood when the Cuban um, exodus, right, was occurring. The Democrats didn't want them. Nope. They didn't want them. They wanted to keep them on the rafts of tires and trash, and they wanted to let them die out and see. Because they knew Republicans they knew. fought for them to come, while Democrats called them criminals. Because Democrats knew that they knew they knew that these were people plan. fleeing from Marxism. Absolutely, mm-hmm. they were fleeing from leftism. And by God, we can't have that. Mm-hmm. Which is also why they discourage immigration from certain European countries and have for years. In the name of anti-racism. Yeah, it's incredible. And uh, we did a thing on Connecticut, uh, Jim. I didn't do one on Rhode Island yet, but Rhode Island's a heavy lift. You know, it seems like, and I'm not the only one who found this, by the way. Emerson did too, which is uh, Rhode Island like looks close sometimes. Because they really want like a Bernie person. And when they don't get a Bernie, they get a corporatist Democrat. They start to get they they get pissy, but then they return in the end anyway. They go, but it's possible that they're only returning because Republicans aren't playing for it. They have seeded whole states. They've seeded whole states. Connecticut, Bob Stefanowski almost took. They almost took Connecticut in twenty eighteen. In truth, the nutmeg state has been bouncing back and forth on the gubernatorial level for decades. Connecticut is a rich target for Republicans. It's got a working class that by all for all intents and purposes should be a should not be a Democrat voting working class anymore. And it's got an affluent but not yuppie demographic that should be voting Republican. It's got like a Carteret County Republican war. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any sense. And by the way, they do vote Republican for the governor. Those people do. What they need is another two points to offset the urban vote. Or try to pull a Donald Trump and take 13% of that urban vote that you didn't have before. I mean... They don't think out of the box. They don't. They like write off Americans. And it pisses me off. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't write off anybody. Democrats play everywhere, man. They'll play in rural areas. They'll go after Jim Meadows. I mean, Mark Meadows seat in North Carolina. If they saw a purple spotted alien from outer space come land, they will be there saying, do you want to register? You get the Democratic ticket. Here, this is how you vote. Get the Democratic absolutely. Republicans like, oh, we haven't carried Connecticut in years. Mm-hmm. Connecticut is super white. It's super, super rich for targets. Not rich money. I'm talking about voter rich targets. They don't do it because they look at that voter file, they open up the voter registration, and they get terrified. Not remembering. That Pennsylvania was D plus 13 when Donald Trump won it in 16. The electorate in the exit polls said D plus three, but it really was. I'm talking about the voter file overall. It was not. Those people just never changed the registration, and they had long been shifting to Republicans. But for years, Republicans had made pitches to that state. Donald Trump played hard for that state. It's not going to happen because demographics are destiny. You have to make it happen. Mm-hmm. 
You have to make it happen. All right, let's see what else we got here. I'm answer one or two more because the old toother's killing me. I know. So, Stephen I Tower. Any update on Cheney airplane. getting recall? She. Oh. I was just saying, note to self: when on the airplane and they offer you pretzels, just say no. Especially when they've been using COVID as an excuse for months not to offer a snack during flights. <laughs> and then when they finally do start to give you a flight again, because it's a long flight, they give you a bag of pretzels that's probably months old. Not going to get into it. I already did get into it. <laughs> I digress. All right. Um, yeah, I would say that. Cheney's going to have to deal with a primary challenge, which he already has. Uh, she's in deep trouble. She's in deep trouble. Because Liz Cheney represents, and I tweeted this before, actually. She doesn't really have a constituency. She won because it's a red state and her name's Cheney. And they gave her the benefit of the doubt. But in point of fact, uh, Liz Cheney represents a small minority of deep state defense contractors in otherwise unwinnable blue America, Maryland, Delaware, Northern Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Her voters now have realized that. Same thing with Mitt Romney, by the way. Um, you know, he doesn't really care. But if he was up for re-election right now, he would lose a primary. Mm -hmm. Mitt Romney would lose a Republican primary. And then the Republican would win the state. Win the seat. You don't have to settle for these people. Especially not in states like Wyoming and Utah. Liz Cheney will get primary challenge and or challenges, looks like. And Republicans should be smart with who they nominate to go against her. Don't let them fracture. This is what they're going to try to do. Fracture the vote. Mm -hmm. That's That has been the rhino uh, way, way yeah. for years their little infiltration kind of conservatives or Trumplicans, you know, they got to weed out the grifts a little bit because there are serious candidates. And then there are others who just weed, who just siphon off the votes happened to Mike Dittmer. Mm -hmm. That's how they did it. If Dittmer. the rest of those candidates, especially particularly one woman, if she just would have gotten out of the race because she knew she had no chance. I don't know what she was doing. All she did was tear away votes from Mike Dittmer in the primary Otherwise, Mike Dittmer would have easily beaten Paul Young in Livingston County. Like I said, they were separated by a few points. Paul spent hundreds of thousands. He raised hundreds of thousands. Dittmer spent, uh, he raised less than 50, spent like nothing. Mm -hmm. But he had the endorsement of Sheriff Clark and all these other people, you, but they didn't know. Doesn't it make you wonder if the other campaign pays that? Some campaign of them the keep in the race. Absolutely. Laura, they're, they're absolutely. It doesn't make me wonder. There are. I don't know if it happened in this case. I will say this that particular woman did say, I wish I did not run. Mm -hmm. Because she realized afterwards, and she, I, was, she, I was a spoiler. Mm -hmm. I, I denied uh, the party a nominee that represented them. And that's, yeah, you know, that's where, that's why. We've been talking about the plans that we've been talking about because I'm tired. I'm tired of uh, dealing with this. Dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Same status quo. All I mean, right. The definition Ooh. of insanity is to do the same thing and expect different results. So. Vermont's a little tough, Jonathan. It is just because of the rural versus urban um, ratio. It the re Republican voters are just too sparsely separated out all over Vermont. I would go for Connecticut first. I really would. I would go for Connecticut. I'd go for Maine, even though you have Bangor and Port. I get that. Um, oh, that was another one. Maine second congressional district because they believed this nonsense. Where is it? I know I still got it. They believed this bogus BS. And they left a viable candidate in Maine's 2nd Congressional District to fend for themselves. And they could have won that damn district. They absolutely could have won that district. Five points, four and a half points, mm -hmm. something like that. Trump won it by eight. That's presidential level. Get a Trump candidate, a Trump-like candidate, a articulate, talented candidate. Loyal. Has a spine. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, really. Well, the point is, really, it's policy too. I mean, well, I'm saying the the Republicans saying. keep running these certain people that are not really totally aligned, mm -hmm. and then they half half ass fund them, Laura. Yeah. You know, so get a Trump a Trump like candidate and ignore this BS when it comes out. Spencer, I'm actually rather confident that you just screwed the pooch on this. It's a very hard area to poll okay bangor daily news 39 38 biden quinnipiac 53 44 biden this is main second congressional district nate at the new york times nate speaking of which, 47 45 all right i will show my shirt speaking of which wait a minute one second i'm a pollster accuracy matters Let's say you were Nate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's hat tip uh, or courtesy of Jim at Susquehanna. Excellent idea. We're going to we're gonna be wearing these shirts a lot to make our damn point. Accuracy matters. All right. Because here we are. Suffolk, same thing. Miraculously. Miraculously. Suffolk finds the same wrong result. Incredible. Colby College. 46, 43, and then here they are, TMR, who is for Bangor Daily. Again, once again, says, I think you're all wrong. <laughs> I pulled this district right last time, and Trump's going to win the district. It's not even going to be close. Everyone, oh, yeah, okay. All right. Smeared, right? That's not a real poll. I got response. I mean, we we got responses when I tweeted the Bangor Daily News poll, which was done by DMR Crit Critical Insights. Um, I was actually getting responses from blue checkers. That's not legitimate. Unlike, in fact, it is legitimate. In fact, it's the only pollster who got it on the nose in 2016. Yes, but look at everybody else. There's a clear consensus. That word. Remember, over and over. There was a clear consensus. Yeah, a wrong one. Pan Atlantic <laughs> Research, 4743. Colby College again, 4642. So here comes Colby, takes another crack at it. You can improve that for freely. Mm -hmm. Here comes Colby, takes another crack at it, and gets it wrong. Even more wrong. From a three to four point and survey USA. Biden plus six, North Carolina, survey USA. 48-45. Biden. Emerson, Spencer, 50-47. So what Spencer is telling you right there, with Biden at 50%, 301 likely voters, which in that is a roughly four and a half percent, um, four point six percent, yeah, sampling era. So what he's telling you is there's about a 90, yeah, that, so it's a 95% confidence mm -hmm. that Joe Biden is absolutely going to win the district. He did not. It wasn't even close. Susan Collins romped it. Trump romped it. And they left this sap. And he lost by what? Three three to five points. That was three to five. Which is so winnable. So winnable, Laura. Thank it you. was... 52.9 to 47. And it's pure laziness. It's Actually, it's CYA. Everybody's too busy trying to keep their own seat and cover their own butts. Yep. And they don't want to waste time because they, I think if they think they go out there, it takes from them. So, therefore, they rather just keep the money where they feel confident. Yeah. Which yeah, is, which there is a point. Is your nose off there, your there is a point where some races, I believe, I really have always believed this, even in the modern era. There's a point where some races are overfunded, Laura. Yes. Where it's not going to have Necessary. much of an impact mm -hmm. left. Right. Like, and I don't want to say anything like horrible here, but like with the okay, take North Carolina. You know, and I know Cunningham was about to beat Tom Tillis. Trump was always going to win North Carolina. It was close, but he was going to win it. Tillis, however, wound up winning it by a little bit more, but only because that race moved in his direction. Cunningham was going to beat him without that scandal, and you know it. 
He was going to beat him. Mm -hmm. Cal Cunningham, you heard it here, folks. You heard it here. Cal Cunningham was going to beat Tom Tillis without that scandal. Why? Because he had a problem. There were certain Trump voters who didn't trust him. And then there were others who didn't particularly like him. And then when the Cunningham scandal came out, the Trump voters were like, oh, God, I got to vote for Tillis now. Mm -hmm. And then those other voters were kind of disgusted, especially women. Certain women. All right, so... Somebody wants me to run. <laughs> you run. Yeah. Leave my wife at home. No, I, I said uh, Laura can do it. Yeah, no Not kidding. Laura. Not Laura, Laura. Yeah, I want Laura to run. I'm going to convince run. Laura to run. Laura I'm going to get a hold of her and convince to her to run. And we will help you run. Yeah, Georgia is not gone yet. Freedom Angel from the Republicans. Absolutely not. No way. This was a very... First of all, we all know in November how I feel about that. I'm not going to pull up the CSV file and start reading off names again. Because we all know mm -hmm. that that happened. All right. But the runoffs... Um, that was a Republican. They defeated themselves. Democrat Warnock and Ossoff did not defeat Loeffler and Purdue. Loeffler and Purdue defeated Loeffler and Purdue. All right. And it, it isn't at all that, um, Republicans or that Democrats did such a great job. It is that, uh, Democrats, did, I mean, Republicans did such a poor job. Vernon Jones should absolutely run against Raphael Warnock. Absolutely. I said that to somebody the other day. <laughs> they were like, how are we going to get the socialist out of our state? I said, you got Vernon's number? I'll call. Vernon will, Vernon will beat him. He'll beat him bad. Kidding me? Absolutely. Need a little bit of money. Vernon will beat him bad. Have you been answering people on locals, by the way? Or no, I'm totally. Ignoring I forgot. Them. Of course, I'm. Totally ah, totally ignoring. <laughs> Sorry, it's just it's a lot to go back and forth on. Well, All right, so I have some of those questions that you answered. In fact, were from locals. Okay, cool. All right, so with that, I think my freaking tooth is killing me, and I'm gonna wrap it there. But um, I'd like to come back tomorrow, folks, if uh, you could spare another day for me. I'd like to do another one tomorrow. There's another direction I want to go in completely. So I wanted to do this, though, because this is so prescient, I yeah. guess is the word. Uh, but there was other things that I wanted to talk about, and I just can't squeeze it all into one show. And I want to start keeping shows to generally one topic, you know what I mean? Uh, unless there's, like, multiple news things that we, we want to discuss, you know, together. But... Uh, I figured this was the way to go today, and I left the rest off the table. So, if at all possible, perhaps you can find the time to circle on back tomorrow, and we can uh, do another Inside the Numbers, okay? If you are a local supporter, I'm going to be doing a rant a little bit later. Um, that's for locals, and I will upload the speech uh, when I get it, all right? I'm going to be waiting on it. All right. And then, by the way, there'll be little clips of it that I'll tweet out. I want to shout out to Glenn's new site. So we were talking about creator.tv. Okay. Glenn uh, has moved it now to gitmo.life. And uh, what was the re it was there was a reason for it. But if you signed up to creator already. It's still the same login. Yeah, it's still the same login. You do have to put your you just pick profile face back up. But yeah. Um, Still the same login. If you haven't checked out this site, and now it's gitmo.life. Hilarious. I love All right. It. Um, it's better than Twitter. Uh-huh. It physically I'm talking about the UI. The UI, yeah. The it's user better. interface is better than Gab. It's better than Parlor, which was always very quirky. So was Gab. Mm -hmm. And it's better than Twitter. And you can choose between Bootstrap or or uh uh, JavaScript. I mean, it's just you can choose different themes. It's really cool. I mean, I really like it. It's a desktop right now, but Somebody, give it time, it'll be the an app. Interface works perfect on your phone or your tablet. Yeah, the inter if yes, phone. it works on your perfect on your phone, your tablet. It's, uh, Wayne Dupree's over there now. My brother from another mother's over there now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna start pushing people over as much as I can. I'm gonna call Steve. Yeah. I'm going to call uh, whenever Glenn wants me to. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to call Steve and tell uh, Bannon to get on over there. Well, they're doing, um, they're creating a live streaming, which we will be Oh, on right. Also. That's so another thing. It'll be able to fix that and get that all together. Yep. We are going to call our peoples and show them. Where It'll take over for Periscope. Mm -hmm. Periscope, by the way, is getting deprecated. And if you guys are on Periscope, you can definitely still follow me. Give me the hearts, uh, you know, likes, whatever they are. Um, yeah, but it is getting deprecated. Twitter is get, uh, doing away with Periscope. And um, when Glenn gets this up, I mean, I bet you anything. Periscope is so freaking quirky, or at least they claim it is. Yeah. They've just taken my broadcasting. That's sure. what they're doing. They're making them unavailable for playback. I guarantee you that won't happen on Gitmo.life. Nope. All right. Uh, and you could change your themes. You could do just so much more. I mean, you know what? Let me show people real quick before we go. Yeah, yeah. Do the live feed. All right. Let's do a live. Yeah. Let me get rid of. Let me stop this screen share. Boom. And by the way, folks, we are doing our damnedest to make sure. Like, if you're on creators, you know, you're like, how does he have the crisp video when he does the creator rant? I mean, the uh, locals rants. And then on the show, it's like this. Well, because this is the different oh. streaming thing. Once we get it, I can't yet share my screen the way I want to share my screen with you. All right. Real and quick, that's the issue. Somebody but here we go. It only has 1,200 users in total. Yes. And that's only because they've been running for eight days. Which yeah. Beat Gab, Twitter, and they've been running. Yeah. They've been, they've been running for a couple of days. And that's not what Creator had. That's that people have to go over and re sign into their account. But yeah, the point is you got to get the word out. That's the point. All right. And this is, it. it's just, yeah, and they can handle it. This has never gone down. That's your notification. There's your messages and your timelines. There's spy. Uh, there's featured. Uh, and by the way, I'm not getting paid anything for this. No. Just sure. so everybody knows, there's no sponsor here. Profile, privacy, reaction, notifications, emails, integration, security, general themes, sidebar, sounds, plugins, import, export, mute, block, word mute, API, other. This is a well-built website. Announcements, you can do your announcement page. Um, and the whole point on this, there's a drive. You want to use your drive. See, look, all my stuff there. And there's a timeline. There's notifications. And, and FYI, for people who are just listening, it's there's Gitmo, G-I-T-M-O dot life, L-I-F-E. Yep. And here, I'll, I'll, I'll send it out in a little uh, comment section thing. That's my profile. And then it will redirect in my profile, and they can uh, watch. Watch Periscope reject it. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it didn't. Uh, yeah, check it out. Play with the user interface. It's really cool. Look at the trending. You guys see that right here? It's way, it's leaps and bounds above Twitter. It looks like my think or swim yeah. trading platform. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so much better. And then even like it, it's more complex too. It is more complex. It, it is. Like if you want to make it more complex and add different things, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's but cool. That's, you know, listen. When I love something, you guys are going to hear about it. So I'm just yep. saying, we did not get paid no money. They can tell you and Manny, awesome details. I love it. Yep. Good job. You guys are awesome. All right. So with that, uh, look, Georgia, like, uh, I just want to answer this real quick. Yeah, yeah. Georgia now that Brian Kemp and Crappy Burger and the rest of them, now they know that signature verification. Or now they want it because now they know a continued allowance of this Tammany-like vote counting is going to mean their own you-know-whats. So now they want this done. So I'll tell you right now, guys, electoral reform will be a big step in the right direction. A big step. I don't believe in coincidences. To me, I have a hard time swallowing the fact that the six battleground states that did not um, abide by integrity deadlines, did not abide by meaningful signature verification matches, did not abide by bans on ballot harvesting or found some way to get around it, were also, also happened to be the states in which Joe Biden got a late arrivals that just pushed him right over. I don't believe in consequences, okay? I mean, in coincidences. Meanwhile, all the ones that did, Ohio, Iowa, 
Florida. No problem. Texas. Mm-hmm. No problem. Come on. Give it a break. Give, me a, give me a freaking break. Yeah, let's shoot for 10 a.m. 10 a.m.? Right? Eastern Standard Time. Because mm-hmm. we're almost there. <laughs> yeah. Physically. I'm going to try to play jet with the rest sucks. of the day. Too. Yeah, jet lag sucks, but it is what it is. Yeah. All right, with that, I'm going to roll. Thanks for watching Inside the Numbers with the People's Pundit. I am your humble host, down earth, the People's Pundit, <laughs> Rich Barons. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and on Gitmo Live, uh, Life. And um, if you uh, like locals, definitely check out and support the locals page, peoplespundit.locals.com. And uh, what else? Facebook Live users, don't forget to like the page, even though you might have noticed there's not much activity on them. I'm not going to like uh, abandon people who are still using those yeah. platforms wholesale, but I'm also not going to race to support them. I'm just not going to do it. All right. So uh, we'll, always, we'll be on YouTube as long as we're still on YouTube. It's really that simple. And then there will be new things coming all the time. All the time. All right. So we love you. We'll appreciate see you tomorrow. You we love there. you. Appreciate you. Thank you for I'm, your support. Thank you for your support. We're going to verbally gonna, money and all. Yeah. Whether you share, whether you contribute, whatever. We love you for it. And we will see you tomorrow. All the best folks. How much you want to open that I can get you back, back inside your head. Before the summer ends and spread a little love Just for a little fun, I'll make you come Back to me before the rise of every sun Baby, it's meant to be, I know you got a man But he don't understand You're gonna be a heartbreaker You're such a love taker Suck me in and you can toss me like a single bear You can't make this stuff up My chest beats is restless Waste the neighbors up above mm, Yeah, baby, come and show me love Baby, come and show me love Because you're gonna be a heartbreaker You're such a love taker So just suck me in And you can toss me like a cigarette Cause I just wanna be a bad habit Steal us away to find a place we can hide It wouldn't take much to disappear for a night Stick it into the need and leave it all behind Cause I know that you know that I know that you want me You told me, now show me, come blow me away Cause I know that you know that I know that you want me You told me, now show me, come blow me away